Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Monday Q&A. Check out that peck bounce to match with the Q&A. First question. I've been arguing with my nutrition professor in class when she says that excess carbs get stored as fat. I tell her that they get burned off as heat and the dietary fat that you ate that wasn't burned off gets stored. She continues to show me in our textbook that I am wrong despite all the data supporting the antithesis. What should I do? She's annoying. Okay, your nutrition professor, rather than looking at the data, is following a party line that a number of medical doctors and other people believe in. It's, it's an old myth, even though we know it's not supported by the data. There's literature to the contrary, but let me cue you in on something. College professors, particularly professors who oftentimes don't have as high of an education as you might think, maybe not as much experience, they're prone to political bias, personal bias, they're oftentimes wrong. But as a student, particularly as an undergrad, your job is not to make waves. You're not doing doctoral work. You're not putting out research that's trying to break down or disprove certain old hypotheses and ideas. You're there to learn the basic material. You're there to get a basic education, get a degree. My advice to people as undergrads, you're oftentimes, no matter what you major in or what you're studying, you're going to run into professors who you disagree with. You know that you're right based upon the data. But guess what? They're the one who gives you a grade. All you need from them is to learn what you can, make the grade, and once you have finished your degree and you're doing stuff in the real world, then go back and disprove all the nonsense and try to put better information out. But if you fight with those professors and you disagree with them and you piss them off, oftentimes they're going to give you bad grades. They're going to take it personal. It could affect your GPA, which in turn could affect you in, in certain negative ways, depending on what's going on. Maybe your scholarships get affected. Maybe your chances of getting into a better grad school could be affected. There's a lot going on there. Don't piss them off. Just nod. Say yes. You raise the point one time. She continues to disagree. Just smile. Leave it alone. And if you write a paper off on it, agree with what the textbook says, unless you know for a fact that that professor is not going to have a problem with you making waves. So carry the status quo. It's the same when it comes to political issues. You might be very far right-wing and have a left-wing professor. You might be very far left-wing and have a right-wing professor. But when you write a paper, just lie. Pretend to be the point of view that they have. They're more likely with their bias to mark your grade up. You get your good grade. You get your degree. Then you go out and you try to make a difference in the real world. You don't make a difference arguing with a professor who can mark your grades down. You're not going to change their mind. All right, next question. When adding a new lift or a lift you haven't used for some time back into your program, should you program it in at the same progression rate as your other lifts, or should you use a faster progression scheme for that lift as it would be proportionately weaker at it and have the potential to progress the weight faster on that lift? Uh, neither one. I don't recommend that you go into a normal progression when you add a new lift back in. Spend a couple of sessions regaining and relearning your strength on it, maybe three sessions and then program it in at the normal rate. It will probably take you, in many cases, a lift you haven't done in six months, but you've kept all the muscles strong. It might only take you three training sessions to get your strength up to maybe even higher than it was before, to get your strength close to appropriate other than the basic motor skills of doing the exercise. So just use three weeks to ramp it up, get it stronger, get it where you need it, relearning the motor patterns for three sessions, and then just progress with it at the normal rate. That's easier than trying to figure out, should I progress with it faster? So no, no, no. Three sessions, progress fast, and then go back to your normal progression on, on what your other lift should be for what you're doing at the time or for whatever program you're running. And that will generally work better for you because you, it should only take you a few sessions, very, very short time to re relearn those motor patterns if the muscles and all the primary movers involved are strong enough. All right, next question. Jason, I'm going into basic training for the Army in six months. I want to go on your intermediate workout program, but I'm afraid I will not be able to do as many push-ups. Currently, I can do 70 good form push-ups. If I got on this program, do you think the added strength will allow me to do more push-ups? You know, this is really tit for tat because, yes, this program will put a lot of strength and muscle on you. But if you're already an intermediate strength athlete, your strength is going to be good when you go into basic. And you could run the program. It's fine. 
it's probably not going to affect your push-ups. you got to remember your strength for, from this training is going to detrain very quickly once you go into basic. It's going to be endurance, endurance, endurance. You're carrying a lot of muscle from lifting. They put you on all that cardio. They restrict your food. You're going to find that your body weight's going to drop. You're going to lose muscle mass in basic training most likely. You're going to lose any extra body fat you probably have if you're holding a lot of muscle you're going to lose strength. It's not going to be a big deal, but it's okay because your body weight will be going down at the same rate. You're losing strength. Your number of push-ups might go up in basic anyways. I wouldn't worry about preparing for that. Just get as strong as you can for now because you're going to want to use that muscle memory after you're done with basic to regain the muscle and strength you've lost there. So I wouldn't really worry about it in that perspective. Just make sure that you're keeping your endurance up, doing lots of running. If you got basic in six months, it'll make your life a lot easier. Because you will be running, 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 running. All right, next question. Jason, what is, in your opinion, the right ideal age to get into lifting seriously? Having an adequate weights progression following the principle of progressive overload, etc. You know, I get asked this a lot. In all honesty, somewhere around age 14 or 15 is really good because that's the age you want to get stronger for sports. Now, I know certain countries do it younger, and they pick people who have the great genetics to become amazing lifters, and they start them out at age 6. But you know what? That's just learning motor skills for those big, heavy exercises. They don't really need them following a serious progressive overload because they're not going to gain muscle and things the way that someone a bit older will from the training. Maybe a slightly higher chance of injury from progressing at, with no real benefit to compensate it. So anyone who's lifting younger than about 14, for the most part, I would say just keep the weights light and learn technique. Because all they're getting out of it is the motor skills and a little bit of strength. And then with about 14 or so, maybe 15, that's when you'll be able to start gaining strength quite at a significant enough rate. Your bone growth will be slowing down enough. Your body will have the extra energy to and resources to put into actually gaining a little bit of muscle tissue faster you will be able to adapt better at that point. So I think that's a good age. And it's, it, there's also a maturity factor to consider that if kids are too young and they want to play around a bit, horse around in the gym, being a little bit older, more mature, I'm not saying 14 or 15 is mature, it rarely is, but less prone to climbing around in the weight room and being hyper, so less chance of injury overall. So I think that's a good starting point to go from. But these things have to be assessed on an individual basis. And that's something maybe a coach who could step in maturely and look at it and give advice there uh, for the individual. All right, next question. Even after multiple weight resets on squats, this is assuming my novice program, I'm stuck at the same weight, 230 pounds. I've noticed form and bar speed begin to suffer at 200 to 225. Should I be weight resetting sooner? I'm actually pushing myself too hard and not recovering enough. You know what I would say? Go ahead and take a deload. I've seen this before. I tell people that a lot of people won't need a deload. Probably half of people will not need a true deload during the novice program, and about half of people will. On a big lift like the squat, if you know you're getting enough sleep, you know you're getting enough food, and it's stalling at 230, which you shouldn't be truly stalling. I'd like to see guys over 300 pounds for sets of five on the program before they get to the end. But again, you're still you're not quite at that point yet. You said it stalled several times, or you reset several times, which means at least three. You know what? Go ahead and take a one week deload. Cut all the weights fifty percent, cut everything down to three sets instead of five, two sets instead of three. Take that week, deload, refresh, recover, come back and try it again and see if you don't push it up to two thirty five next time. That's well, for most people who's in your situation, that should go ahead and push you past that, assuming sleep, nutrition, and everything else are adequate. All right, next question. <clears throat> what happened to your form critique videos? Will that segment ever make a comeback? You know, in all honesty, the amount of work I put into that versus people who viewed it, it just simply wasn't worth it. And I know people say, well, you should care that about more than just views. Well, I do make videos that I know are only going to get a couple thousand views sometimes just for fun to do them. But these videos weren't even getting a couple thousand views. I, at the time, would look up and I would put up a, a video that was getting 8,000 views. I would put up the forum critique video and it would get 300 views, 400 views. Now, the person who I critiqued and maybe some of their personal friends were ecstatic and they thanked me, but no one else really watched the videos. They were just not interesting to the viewers and uh, it just simply wasn't getting views and it took me more work than shooting a conventional video to do that at the time to do all the splicing and then analyzing what they were doing and trying to give honest evaluations 
it was taking more work per minute of video footage to make those than other videos and they were getting in some cases less than 10 percent of the views that my other average videos were getting so i needed to make 10 form critique videos to get the the number of views and the outreach that a single normal video was getting they were just not popular the first couple were popular and after that no one really wanted to watch them anymore so they're, they're just not something the audience seems to be interested in and i don't want to make videos that no one's going to watch what's the point of having a youtube channel if you're making videos specifically for the point of only a few people watching them and no one else being interested you could do that on your facebook page so no they just weren't popular and I, I pay attention to what people want to see when I make videos believe it or not I pay close attention to what gets watched what doesn't it, it, particularly after it's been done several times all right next question Jason how tough should your intermediate program be starting week three tomorrow and first two were far from easy let's say <laughs> week three is going to be hard if, if the first two weeks were, were already hard for you work three is going to be brutal for people who do normally just heavy powerlifting most of the year, the first two blocks of this program are going to be brutal. If you're normally trained uh, what they consider bodybuilding style, mostly just higher reps, the last six weeks are going to be brutal. This is a general strength training program. This is to balance your all-around strength through different rep ranges to use those different rep ranges to build your performance through other rep ranges and to periodize it and to build your general overall strength for a wide variety of sport purposes is to make you a very functional strength athlete and so it whatever your week is at it's going to bring it up but that's also going to be the most difficult so it sounds like to me if those first two weeks were hard for you you're going to really struggle on week three it means you've probably done almost exclusively low reps which is fine but again, this is a general strength training program for a wide variety of athletes. It's going to shore up those weak points and you're going to have to get better at them. But yeah, week three is going to be tough. And it's intended to be tough for anyone who doesn't have a massive amount of strength stamina already. But you know what? You'll adapt to it and when you get to week four, you'll get to unload from all that workload a bit and, and recover from it and adapt better while you're stimulating the, the new adaptations. So generally, the easier weeks are going to be week one, week four, week seven, etc. But everything in with this every third week is going to be really hard. All right, next question. Is there, is there a study that I can quote or show medical professionals that dismiss any aches and pains or any other issues as being my fault for being obese? In the UK, the BMI is like the Bible, and they will not entertain the notion that not everybody fits neatly in the chart range. You know what? That's actually not true. I know multiple athletes, because I, I chat with guys about this at big meets here in the UK. We've all talked to and agreed and even found all the stuff on the NHS website that the NHS's official stance is that they do not, and I repeat, do not use BMI for people who lift weights routinely for people who are bodybuilders or people who are strength athletes of any type, such as powerlifters, weightlifters, rugby players, things like that. They do not use BMI for that, and it says that specifically under the NHS BMI guidelines. So if you lift weights very regularly, they're not supposed to be looking at your BMI and considering it. So I don't know why they're doing that. Now, on the other hand, for over 90% of the population, the BMI is accurate. You do fit perfectly. If you're outside of it, you're fat or you're too thin very very simple it does work for the vast majority of people unless they have a lifestyle explanation explaining different and in fact what you'll find is that the majority of people who fall outside the bmi while not being obese are generally on peds you know anabolic steroids things like that majority of drug-free lifters who particularly if they haven't finished out their new gains should still fall within the bmi guidelines now as far as the aches and pains and things go well that's something you have to take seriously as, as a guy with a lot of muscle who's actually been bigger than i am now in the past i can tell you that a lot of times you will get certain aches and pains things like your feet things like that from carrying a lot of muscle mass the same thing when you, you carry a lot of muscle things like your hips and your shoulders will sometimes hurt from just the way you sleep on them so carrying that exercise can cause some aches and pains it is sometimes something that you have to live with as a result of carrying a lot of extra muscle weight. And if you can't live with that, 
then you do need to lose the muscle weight. It's just not for you. It's not if it's not improving your quality of life and it's giving you aches and pains that you can't deal with or you don't want to deal with, then the medical professionals are right. Then lose a little bit of muscle mass. So in effect, they are right regarding that particular issue. It can put extra taxes on your body that can cause some annoyances to carry around a lot of muscle mass. It's not all pros. There are some cons to it also, and take that into consideration and, and weigh that out if it's worth it to you. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time. But let me give you guys a bicep shot before I go. Oh, Mount Bicephius. <laughs>